All right, who's on Twitter? Raise your hands. See this? MDTW13. That is our hashtag for this conference. There are other people. Um, there are people uh, tweeting with this hashtag and talking about it. And we're creating some buzz. So um, use this when you uh, talk about the conference, and feel free to publicize the conference as much as you possibly can. It's my pleasure to introduce Scott Benson. Scott's going to be leading our panelist discussion that we're going to have. Uh, Scott is an urban planner with 15 years of experience in community and economic development, commercial real estate, and municipal planning. His most recent experience has been with Midtown Detroit, where he has managed small business development in Detroit's Midtown area. He's a graduate of Wayne State, Hampton University, and the National Defense University. Scott's long career of service includes 20 years in the military that have taken him to Kuwait and to Gulfport, Miss Gulfport Mississippi, immediately following Katrina. Scott is currently a candidate for the Detroit City Council, District 3. Scott, thank you. All right, thank you. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to get started with a brief stretch, because I know that transit is a passion for everybody here, but after a lunch, we want to make sure that no one's falling asleep. So if you wouldn't mind, let's just stand up. We don't want anybody getting an embolism here. There you go. All right, let's just get a quick stretch. Hands over your head. Get on your tiptoes. Get that blood flowing. Nice stretch there. Excellent. Thank you. All right, for this afternoon session, we have three distinguished speakers. First, we're going to introduce Thomas R. Strout from Avant Partners, LLC, in St. Louis, Missouri, who's going to discuss some of the successes that they've had as far as uh, getting a transit tax pass there. Um, in 2005, Chris created Michigan Now, the only, in oh, excuse me, there we go. It led Citizens for Modern Transit for 22 years. In 2010, as the organizer's executive director, Tom conceived, managed, and produced an outreach program to the citizens of St. Louis County about the benefits of transit to everyone, whether they ride it or not. The result was a 63% win at the polls for a transit tax after a defeat of an identical reassure 17 months before. After retirement in 2008, Tom formed Avant Partners with his wife, Deb. Wife, Deb? All right, let's identify significant others. We like significant others. We're also going to introduce Che Watkins, the VP of Transportation, Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, um, education and campaign manager for the Citizens of Transportation Mobility from 2011 and 2012, working on the campaign that would have funded $8.5 billion in transportation improvements through a regional 1% sales tax. From 2007 to 2011, Ms. Watkins was Vice President of External Affairs at the Metro Atlanta Chamber. Currently, Che is managing EDUPAC, a nonpartisan independent political organization and the Committee for a Better Atlanta Evaluation Process, a coalition of business and business organizations who help citizens make informed voting decisions in the city of Atlanta. In addition, we're going to have a change from our schedule, and Randy Rinchler, the Director of Legislation and Public Affairs for the San Francisco Bay Area's Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Bay Area Toll Authority, will be our third panelist today. Mr. Rinchler's advances advances the legisl legislative public outreach and external communications objectives of the 19-member commission at the local, state, and federal levels. Before joining MTC, Randy worked as an investment banker structuring local government debt. He guest lectures on the subject of public finance for transportation at San Jose, UC Berkeley, Stanford, and the University of San Francisco. With no further ado, Tom, come on up and talk about your, how ordinary citizens made the difference to pass a transit tax. Thank you very much. And it's good to be with each of you talking about uh, the importance of transit and how to make something uh, really happen. I thought I might, it's not in my PowerPoint slides, but in listening to the discussion here, I'm going to add a couple of comments about Citizens for Modern Transit. It's a membership organization as opposed to a coalition. And 
This group began meeting about 30 years ago in 1983 and officially incorporated in 1985. And I came on board in uh, 1988 to lead the organization through, there was a typo, through 2010. After we won our referendum, I said, hey, age 62, the time, the time horizons on transit, it's time to go and let somebody else do it so I can deal with shorter timelines, you know. So that's, that's a brief history. Uh, just as you think about moving forward uh, with citizen involvement and in some kind of citizen's organization, there are going to be days when you love the transit agency and then there are going to be those other days. So keep that in mind as you th think about uh, coming together and uh, doing, um, the, for lack of a better word, the Lord's work. Uh, a little bit of an overview of St. Louis Transit. We have 75 bus lines. We have 44 miles of light rail. The first line opened in 1993. We have a robust paratransit service, and we have about 55 million passengers annually. Um, as compared to 37 million in 1992, uh, the year prior to the opening of Metrolink. So the, the addition of the rail service has made a huge difference in transit services in St. Louis. And we've had 15 billion in economic development within a half mile of the light rail stations. I do not claim that those developments would not have happened without light rail, but it seems like there could be some connections and maybe some academic will decide to study it at some point. Um, how are we funded? Um, our regional transit authority, uh, was something called the Bi-State Development Agency that was created by an act of Congress in 1949. It did not get into the transit business until 1964. That's when they bought up all the struggling uh, transit uh, providers in the greater St. Louis region and consolidated and tried to organize it so that it worked better. In 1974, the county council and uh, the city of St. Louis Board of Aldermen passed a half cent sales tax to uh, uh, provide assistance to the transit agency. In 1993, the voters of St. Clair County, Illinois, if you remember Leo's presentation, we have three entities involved in transit. We have the city of St. Louis, which is its own county. We have St. Louis County, and we have St. Clair County Transit District in Illinois. Um, Voters approved a, a quarter cent sales tax um, in August of 1994. This was on the heels of the opening of, of uh, Metrolink, which was wildly successful beyond anyone's imagination. And so they were in the mood to have a quick expansion, which then came 10 years later. Um, in uh, 1997, St. Louis City approved uh, a quarter cent sales tax, but it failed in um, St. Louis County in um, that same year and did not come back for 13 years. It took 13 years, well it came back in 2008 when we lost, but we weren't able to put that funding in place in 2000, until 2010. In, in Missouri there's inconsequential state funding and then of course the fare box and the St. Louis City and St. Louis County appropriate money to Metro. The money does not go directly to Metro and that causes for some interesting times. Uh, so what were our challenges in 2010 following this loss at the ballot box? Um, there were perceived troubles at Metro and just uh, a little local uh, connection. Our transit agency uh, prior to that was being led by a man by the name of Larry Salsi. Anybody know Larry? He's a graduate of this institution. Uh, he ran the Detroit transit system on loan from Chrysler, I think it was. In what year, Art? Uh, 1975? Yeah. So, anyway, uh, there was a lot of turmoil in the media. People perceived that Metro was not being properly operated, although Larry had done a terrific job in cleaning up a lot of things at Metro, but nevertheless, there was this perception. We had a loss in 2008, as I mentioned. There were subsequent service cuts. Uh, Metro went out and informed the public. 
if you don't pass the tax, here's what's going to happen. I don't think the public believed it because they had uh, actually, as a public agency, had done a good job of continuing to find resources to, to push back the time when, uh, when the numbers just didn't work. Um, and of course, the rise of the Tea Party, as was mentioned earlier. And then we found a tough time to raise money to put something back on the ballot. The business community was saying, uh, this isn't the right time. Metro hasn't cleaned up its act. And just as an aside, because it's an important part of the narrative, typically the way a referendum for anything is passed in St. Louis, um, the, the backers make a trip over to an organization called Civic Progress. They decide, yeah, we'll fund it. They write the check, and you're in business. Um, we have a member of my board at the time, a guy by the name of Don Music, was very close to the president of Civic Progress and went over to talk to him about the needs of putting this referendum on the ballot. And Don tells a great story. The short of it is he nearly got kicked out of the office. Wrong time. We're not funding it. We don't want any part of it. And another thing is we were polling 53% uh, favorable. And a lot of campaign consultants will say, on a tax measure, I want you at 60% because the campaign usually results in drop off as opposed to add on. And so we were at 53. Um, and as I said, the business community was cool. So what did Citizens for Modern Transit do? Um, uh, Leo's description was off just a little bit at lunch. Uh, Citizens for Modern Transit is a C3. Um, so we created a coalition that could do some paid advocacy and Citizens for Modern Transit decided because of the frustration, the lack of money coming in, that we would fund an education campaign about uh, six weeks prior to the referendum. And that's what we did. Um, <clears throat> C3s, this is pay attention to what's in the, the IRS has been talking about the last couple of days. C3s can do some advocacy. It's limited. But you can do some advocacy, which we would do. So we bifurcated the campaign. We had the education campaign for four weeks, and then we had a three-week vote yes campaign. Or we did. Another group did. Um, one of the things we did, we organized a steering committee. How can we get around the business community's lack of support? How can we do that? Um, as we said, we created the Transit Alliance, and we began to empower the members of our coalition, saying, this is going to be a low-budget thing. We've got to have volunteers, and we need to deploy you in smart ways. So we identified our champions. We built the coalition. We developed an education campaign budget. We did some research and polling, and we developed some targeted messaging. Our champions included uh, John Nations. <clears throat> John was important for a couple of reasons. Um, he was the mayor of a suburban community, and he was a Republican. Now, I don't want to get partisan here, but um, in your polling, Oftentimes, on transit measures, you find less support among Republicans than you do among Democrats. I don't want to overgeneralize, but that kind of seems to be a trend. So we neutralize the opposition because John knows all the Republicans in St. Louis County. And he was able to say, sit this one out. Don't fund anything. Don't do anything. The other thing he did, he, uh, as part of the campaign, he hired Republican consultants. They didn't know much about transit, I, I must admit, <laughs> but they weren't being hired by anybody else. So we kind of dried up the well, or he did. We also had Don Suggs. Don is the uh, publisher of the St. Louis American, the leading African-American newspaper in the St. Louis region. And he was vitally important to mobilizing African-American support. 
As a lesson learned in 2008, our county executive in, in 2008 took a higher profile um, advocacy on behalf of voting yes on what was then Prop M. And um, uh, Mr. Dooley's African American, everybody thought, hey, I guess he'll talk to the African Americans. It never happened. I mean, it never happened. So, lesson learned, we weren't going to let that happen in 2010. Um, <clears throat> Mark Wrighton, the, the Chancellor of Washington University, was a champion. Um, <clears throat> what he was able to do is he began circumventing the negative decision by the, the business group not to support the campaign because he, a lot of the, these same people sit on his board of directors. So he started making individual calls. I want you to come to my house for dinner. We're going to have a bunch of other people. We're going to talk about transit. Well, you don't turn down an invitation from Mark Wright to have dinner at his home. So they were all there, and we began to slowly put together a steering committee of higher profile, wealthier interest in the community to try to get behind this. And I think I've got a let me set this up. This is a, a clip in a St. Louis ballroom um, in a January evening where Mark, where the Chamber of Commerce was presenting Mark with their highest award. And this is the tail end of his acceptance speech. But my appeal for support is for an <coughs> investment in our region an investment in our public transportation system. I've agreed to work with other civic leaders to assure the passage of a ballot initiative on April 6th in St. Louis County. We're anxious... <laughs> We're anxious to assure that everyone in this community is able to get to their work to participate in cultural and sports events, and to be involved in a strong and robust community. We know that an investment in Metro is an important in the future of our economy. And I hope you'll all join me and many others in working to support this very important initiative. Thank you once again for your support. So in our coalition, I know you can't read this, but one of the things we did, um, like I said, we realized that we needed volunteers. So we went to groups like in St. Louis, here it's Moses, in St. Louis it's Metropolitan Congregations United. And we said, essentially we said this, we don't have the time, we don't have the money to reach out to these organizations. You uh, head of MCU, you know these groups, you know the uh, religious community, you're empowered to reach out to them. Please stay on message, but you're empowered. And we did this in a whole variety of sectors, and you can talk about this later in the, in the breakout session, and we're, we'll talk about it tomorrow morning in detail when you come back. But what we figured was some people will do a lot, some people will do some things, and some people will fall down on the job. But I took the view, whatever got done was more than I was going to be able to accomplish. As an example, we had a, a woman who came to some of the coalition meetings. She was involved in children's issues, you know, got, got acquainted a little bit. She didn't want to volunteer to knock on doors. She didn't want to phone bank and so yeah come to the meeting so one day she said you know i've got a group meeting next tuesday can you come out and talk to them about this so i said sure so i went out and in the room there were 50 social services child advocacy organizations represented we walked out of the room with 50 endorsements you know, she did her thing. 
She knew what she knew what was that she, what she could do, and she got it done. And we had that happen over and over and over, with volunteers stepping up with a simple assignment: do what you can, and we got a lot done. So here are some of the groups you've talked about them. We, you know, it's the same same list you put together. Um, Education campaign budget. Citizens for Modern Transit dug into its reserves and we budgeted $300,000. St. Louis is a medium sized market, by the way. Um, we went across the river to the St. Clair County Transit District. CMT had worked a relationship with them over the last several years. And we said to the 80 year old board chair, Dolores Lysakowski, who's just a conservative old German grouchy woman at times. <laughs> and I mustered up my courage and I said, Dolores, I need a hundred grand. And she gulped and said, well, I got to talk to the board and we got it. We got it. Um, and then we had $25,000 in donations. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And basically our education campaign sort of, sort of centered around television, radio, billboards, transit, web, social media, coalition building and endorsements. And so here's one of the radio spots. I'm here on the 57 bus to St. Louis talking to passengers about transit. Hi there, what's your name? Nancy. And you ride transit? I do every day. A lot of people do. In St. Louis, transit gives over 100,000 rides a day. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? I'm a nurse. Oh, if so if there wasn't any transit, you couldn't get to work. Not where I live now. I'd have to move or find another job. And if you couldn't get to work and I happened to go to the hospital? <laughs> you die. <laughs> so it's a matter of life and death. Absolutely. Makes you think of all the people we rely on who rely on transit. It sure does. Healthcare workers, office workers, store clerks, teachers, servers. Nurses. Nurses, sure. Radio announcers. <laughs> right. Transit. Some of us ride it, all of us need it. Yeah, you wouldn't really die. I, I was just joking, you know. Oh, I'm glad. You might have to wait for a bed pan, though. For more information, visit citizensformoderntransit.org. Paid for by Citizens for Modern Transit. You know, we, we all laugh at the story. What's interesting, John Nations, the campaign manager, tells this story he, as Mayor Chesterfield. When Metro made its cutbacks after the loss in 2008, he gets a phone call from one of his constituents, and, and it's a woman who said, uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to talk to you about something. That is, um, we need more transit out here in Chesterfield. My, as you know, my mom's out in the nursing home. And the other day, all the employees were turning in their letters of resignation. And these are the people that take care of mom, you know. There are people who've built a relationship with her. And they can't get to work. And uh, he said, well, we're trying to do something. We're trying to contract with Metro for a bus or two a day. And she said, and there's one more thing I want to tell you. I voted against it in 2008. I didn't think it impacted me. Yeah, five minutes. Okay, I'll skip one of the radio. This is the TV we did. And notice in all these spots, we don't say to vote on it. Transit has my support. It brings 20% of the fans to our games. It carries 25,000 of my university students, faculty, and staff. Many students couldn't get to class without it. It's how people you depend on get to work. It helps build a vibrant community. It got me to high school. It's slow. Our community needs it. I love transit. Transit. Some of us ride it. All of us need it. An important thing about this spot, as soon as this hit, a um, couple of things happened. One is, why didn't you invite me to be in it, you know? Um, the second thing that happened, and I'll talk about it in the lessons learned, we started getting checks in, unsolicited. You know, we had an engineering firm said, you know, we got burned a few years ago, we don't give to anything that's political. 
here's $15,000 for your effort, you know. We had a check come in from a art thing, unsolicited. We're working in another city, and uh, tell you about, well, let me show you Hitchhiker first. There was high awareness, by the way, that the cuts had had an impact, so this is the spot that we developed. Without transit, 10,000 people couldn't get to the game. More than 100,000 wouldn't make it to work. Thousands of college students would miss class. And some people wouldn't go anywhere. Sure, without transit, people would still have transportation options. Just not good ones. Transit. Some of us ride it. All of us need it. Billboards. Okay, we ran until March 15. John started his campaign right up after up after that, you know, vote yes on Prop A. Um, we gave some money to the um, vote yes campaign. We did the Speakers Bureau. We maintained the website. Uh, students did the social media. Um, just as an aside, interesting, three years ago, there was no Twitter. Unbelievable, you know. We had great Facebook. Uh, we helped our, organize the unions, help us with the phone and the door-to-door. -door. We did voter ID. Our, our ground game strategy was we wanted to talk to people who were likely to vote yes and to remind them to vote yes. We didn't want to talk to people who were likely to vote no. This was nothing about trying to change anybody's mind. It was to outperform the other side. And so we, tar we targeted different... Uh, Okay, you told me I have a look. Okay, we won th 63 to 37. I'm trying to get to a map. As I said, fundraising was not fully explored. We're working in another city and recently ran an education campaign of about 600,000, all funded by local government. The um, foundations, Universities, hospitals gave to us, other not-for-profits. Uh, some lessons learned involved consultants with transit experience. Um, ask early, as I was saying earlier. Make sure that the people who care about this the most are involved. We worked with consultants in 08 who didn't know how to work with volunteers. And so that asset was not fully deployed. We win. And here's the differences. On the left is the 08 map. Blue is where we won in 08. The dark blue is where we tar targeted our uh, vote yes. We knew that's where the likely yes voters were. Uh, the pink down at the far bottom of the page, we hope those people didn't know about the campaign. And they, they didn't. That, they had about a 16% turnout uh, down there, we were up at 22, up in the blue areas. So we were able to affect who came to the polls. And so we won. All right, Thomas, thank you for that great presentation. Next, we're going to have Che Watkins from Atlanta. And Detroit, right? Yes, born and raised in Detroit. Um, so I am here today to talk to you about um, the other side, the dark side of the referendum process. Um, okay. So yes, my name is Shay Watkins and I'm here from um, Atlanta. I was the campaign and education manager for the Atlanta referendum process. I um, grew up here in Detroit, in Southfield, Michigan, actually. Um, and my parents still live here. Most of my family's still here, so I'm very happy to be here. And what I have found in researching what we're doing here and what we did in Atlanta is there's a lot of similarities. A lot of those barriers that we listed up there for Detroit Basically, we had all the same barriers except for maybe the car company influence part. But other than that, we had all the same barriers. So let me talk to you a little bit about um, our situation and um, some of the lessons that we learned around why we didn't um, succeed. 
So Mike Lukovich is our um, newspaper cartoonist. And this is one of the cartoons that he did um, during the referendum campaign. You'll see that the Metro Atlanta transportation hell entrance. And the line says that the penny sales tax increase would pay for an exit to get out of hell, hopefully. So everybody, I think, around the country understood that Atlanta had a problem. We were the fastest, one of the fastest growing regions, yet we only spent about 48th in the country in terms of transportation infrastructure. Um, our MSA would, have, would add thir 3 million people, that's a million people for the next 10 years, to our region. Um, our gas tax had not been increased since 1971, and there was certainly no appetite to do that. What you have to understand about where I had to do, had to do this is I'm in Georgia. Georgia is a completely red state. Um, the Tea Party was founded in some parts of Cobb County, which, is, which was in our region. So we had a, a very interesting dynamic of who we had to deal with and what we had to do. But what we decided was, and this effort was mainly led, compared to some of the others, by the business community. Um, I work for the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, and we really led the four-year effort to get the um, bill passed to actually be able to do this referendum. We did the, we found, the, pulled the data, we talked to all of these, these other cities to see what they did, and kind of came up with a fact base in order to get this done at the legislature. So we had, we, it took four years for us to get the ability to tax ourselves. What you have to also understand is the governor at the time um, did not think that this was a good idea. And when he finally decided to let us do this, he created a plan on how we would do it. We had recommended things that we wanted to do, but what happened was um, this was the first regional tax in Georgia ever. Um, the state was divided into 12 regions. Uh, the elected officials in each region picked the projects that would go on the list. Some of the money would go back to local governments for them to use for local purposes. It was a one cent sales tax. We did not have the ability to do fractional taxes and still don't. Um, some people say it's because Georgians don't know how to do fractions, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, it was a 10-year term. The sales tax excluded um, motor fuels, Grocery, it included groceries and over-the-counter drugs, which was some, something that came out in the process by the NAACP and some others that it was a regressive sales tax. And you needed a simple majority for the whole region. So this is the state of Georgia, and these are the 12 regions, and the pink region is the Atlanta region. Now what you also have to understand is that 46% of the state lives in the Atlanta region. So our population was um, about five million people that we had to get to and talk to in order to make this happen. So this was the convoluted, some would say, um, project selection process. There were different iterations of the list. Leo talked to you a little bit about where we started with the big wish list of $32 billion and these local elected officials from 10 different counties in the region had to whittle that list down and come up with a plan, and um, that was the project list that we had to go with. So from 32 billion, they got to 8 billion. Mysteriously, it, it was half transit and half roads. You could have used this for any transportation purposes, but it ended up being half transit and half roads, which we were astonished, because the appetite for transit is just not as high um, in Georgia as it is in other places. So this process, as you can see, took from the summer of 2010, which is um, four months after the bill passed, until October 15, 2011. So for, for running the campaign and managing the campaign, we couldn't do anything until the project list was done. But in the meantime, you know, people were seeing what projects were on the list, what projects were coming off the list, and so there was some consternation during that process. So the final list contained 157 projects. There were roads, there were sidewalks, there were um, interchange improvements, there was transit improvement, there was some little operations, there was um, improving a, um, a tower at an airport. There was a little bit of everything on this list, and it was $6.1 billion. Like I said, half and half transit and roads. 
Um, 1.1 billion would have gone back to local governments to use for their own transportation purposes. 600 million was going to go to MARTA, which is our transit system. And let me say a couple things about MARTA. Um, there were uh, some perceptions um, in the region that MARTA A didn't go everywhere that it needed to go, which is true. Um, there are perceptions that we that MARTA wasn't able to operate favorably within the market. There, so there were some negative connotations associated with MARTA. And there were negative associations um, with MARTA really around some of the political dynamics. MARTA is mainly African American run. Some of the Republican leadership at the state don't like MARTA and are consistently trying to manage MARTA even though they don't put any money into the, into the coffers at MARTA. So you've got that political dynamic. The Beltline is basically um, a circle around the city of Atlanta with trails and parks, and we, the plan was to put some transit around that. Some of the suburban counties called it a um, tourist attraction, which it wasn't. It's a transportation project, but we had that, that suburban city dichotomy going on as well. And we were going to rebuild all of our bottlenecks on the interstates. So as soon as we passed the bill and the project list process started over here, we started building our coalition. And again, this is the business community. So we're at the Chamber of Commerce and we go out and try to build as big of a coalition as we can. And basically we started meeting on the first Friday of every month in August of 2010 and we called ourselves the First Friday Coalition. We had 150 members by the summer of 2012 and some folks could advocate and some folks could educate. So we had to separate them. What the, one of the things that we also had was we had about 300 companies in Metro Atlanta that were that assigned a person responsible for working on the referendum. So they would come to the Metro Atlanta Chamber and we would give them all the information and they would go back to their companies and talk about the referendum. So we had significant business engagement and business support. These are um, just a list of some of the groups that could do advocacy. You'll see about the Bicycle Coalition, um, the Metro Black Chamber of Commerce, the, Buck the Buckhead area is kind of the in-town, um, northern area of town. So we had a great um, diverse network. And these are some of the people that had to stay neutral but could still work on the referendum. So we had a lot of groups that were engaged. And at, at the very beginning, we tried to make it as big of a tent as possible. Anybody that wants to come and help, anybody that wants to get information, just come. Anybody and everybody is welcome. So we started doing our baseline polling, and it told us that we might have a little bit of a challenge in terms of um, the concept of a tax, of a sales tax. Um, we're in Georgia, Tea Party country, and we were, if you think about May of 2011, this is right in the depths of the recession. So we knew we were going to have a problem from an economic perspective, and it was consistent among demographics. So we had to make sure that we um, talked to people about the benefits of this referendum and, and specifically tie it to job creation because we knew that that would be a good impact um, for the region. So we did. We did a targeted mail campaign. We did social media. We did broadcast cable and radio. What you have to also remember is that the Atlanta market is a very expensive media market. So the business community had to raise, basically raise the money to, um, to do this effort. And we raised $9 million to, to do this effort because the biggest part of our expenses was TV, quite frankly. Um, we had the corporate program. We had um, Clear Channel was um, a member of the chamber and they actually donated um, a lot of billboards to us in order to do this. So we definitely had you know, some engagement. Um, we had the field teams out there where they were, you know, the ground game that you heard talked about. We had the speakers bureau. We had people going out and making all these presentations. We had phone calls. We met with the First Friday group monthly. We met with this coalition monthly to try to help them along in the process, to help tell them what to do, what not to do, and just to keep the coalition moving. And our messages were jobs, jobs, jobs. Less traffic, more jobs, get home faster. 
one of the one of the things that you realize about Atlanta is that you manage your day and your week and your month and your life around traffic. What time do I need to leave work? What time do I need to leave the house? What time do I need to make sure I get my kids to the ball game? That kind of thing. And you manage your entire life around traffic. That's not natural. And that's what we were trying to get across to people. And we needed to stay competitive. Atlanta had grown and prospered since 1996 when we had the Olympics, but we had kind of sat on our laurels for a little while and didn't make the investments that we needed to make. So we needed to make sure that we kept our competitive position. Um, and we wanted to move towards a more modern, clean, fast transit system and get MARTA um, to the place where it needed to be. And we were all very excited about that. But then we had the perfect storm. The economy sucked, quite frankly. Um, there was a huge lack of trust in government. The Tea Party, the NAACP, the um, Sierra Club, like Leo said, they all came out against us and said, you know, you can't trust that this $8 billion is going to go to where it says it's going to go, even though we had a specific project list. You can't trust that it's going to end in 10 years, even though by law it had to end in 10 years. You can't trust that, um, you can't trust who's going to be responsible for doling this money out, even though there was a strategy for doing that. Um, but the lack of trust in government and institutions was high. And if you think about it, this was led by the business community. And at that time, you know, people weren't that high on business in general. It was the first ever regional referendum that we had. It was very complex. There were 157 projects that we had to try to explain to people. And we didn't have an obvious champion in the region. If you think about our 10 county region, the five counties on the outer rim were mostly Republican. And the, there's three counties in the middle that are mostly Democrat. And while the governor supported it, the next governor supported it, the mayor of Atlanta. We had all these folks that were supporting it, but we couldn't have one individual visible champion for the region because not one person spoke to the entire region because the region, quite frankly, was so big. And we're 45% of the population with very divergent needs and wants from a transportation perspective. So you saw this. Um, this chart that Leo put up, and Leo, by the way, is going to have to pay for my um, therapy after he made me come back to this horrible time in my life when we lost the referendum. So I'll let you know how much that's going to cost Leo. So after uh, we lost, um, you know, everybody basically was like, the sky is going to fall. Um, Denver's going to eat our lunch. You know, we're, we're going to lose everything. We did get a downgrade in our um, credit rating when it didn't pass. So that did that was a bad thing. And we kept talking about, you know, there's no plan B, there's no plan B. Plan B is toll roads and hot lanes and things like that. And um, people didn't believe us. And in the the vote was um, 63 no to 37 yes, completely opposite of St. Louis. Then the sun rose the next day after the July 31st referendum. Um, July 31st was the day um, of our referendum, which you heard Leo talk about. And yes, the sun did rise. It wasn't very high in my house, but the sun did rise. So reflections. Our region was way too big. 10 counties was just way too many counties with too many divergent needs for us to make this successful. The project list process was complicated, and there were way too many projects on the list to try to distill down into sound bites for people. Um, the tax may have been too expensive. A penny is a big pill to swallow for some people. And we've been talking about trying to get a regional tax, a uh, fractional tax, but, and we're still working on that. The election date, it was July 31st, right in the middle of the summertime. Maybe we would have done better if it were in November when there's a general election going on. Um, and there was nothing, ma nothing else major on the ballot at that point that we could piggyback on. So when you go through this process and try to figure out how you want to accomplish this, think about when's the best time to do, to do a, an election. What works best for your area? Look at who your voters are going to be and make sure you can bring them out to vote. 
economic conditions. There's not a whole lot you can do, but one of the things that we had asked the legislature was to allow us to decide when we wanted to do the referendum, but they decided it would be July 31st, 2013. The scope of the tax, the amount, the term, things like that. The engagement of citizens, make sure that you do that. Um, I will say that I'm very pleased to see so many different people here, and a lot of times people said to us, well, nobody invited me to the table. Nobody asked me to come to the table. We asked in a very general way, and I'm not quite sure how, mu how much more of an ask we could do. Sometimes it's the responsibility of everyone else to kind of come to the table. You know when the, we've publicized every meeting, and sometimes even when people come to your table, they can decide that they're going to be against it, which is what happened with the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club was at the table. They were in the discussions, and they made a decision to not support the referendum. Keep it simple. What's in it for me? We've heard that before. And work as proactively as possible with the media. Because they're, they're, unless they feel like they're in in the beginning, they could be your worst enemy. Is there any media here? And I, there were some other thoughts that I had while I was sitting there, um, but I'm really excited for my hometown to be on the verge of this. Um, you guys have, are even further than we were. We didn't have a regional transit authority. All of our entities are all spread out, so the fact that you have an RTA, in fact, I posted it on my Facebook. I said, look at my hometown from the past as ahead of my hometown of the, of the current. So you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. And that regionalism concept, you got to nail it. You got to nail it. Thank you. Jay, excellent presentation. Next, we're going to call Randy up to uh, talk about the Bay Area. What's that? No, I'm going to be fine, really. We're going to work on the internet here for a minute. Is it working? Oh, great. Okay, well, I'll mess with it as I go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Randy Rentschler. I uh, work for what's called the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a fill-in, so you have to forgive the raggedness here. Um, you know, I think Winston Churchill once said that, uh, you know, the Yanks will show up and they'll do the right thing, um, but not before they've exhausted every other alternative. And I, I think to a certain extent that describes my home state of Michigan and particularly southeastern Michigan. Um, I graduated from Michigan State University uh, and I ended up going out west until the road ended and I guess I had to stop. So that's what happened. Um, here we are. So um, in any event, first thing I'd like to do is to thank the organizers of this event. This is a seriously good conference with really good information. The people that are here are really telling you what it really takes in order to succeed. Uh, the story uh, of Mr. Zane in LA, I think, is really an instructive one for southeastern Michigan. You know, the Bay Area is about seven million people. Three major cities, San Jose being the largest, San Francisco, Oakland, also Silicon Valley is there. No one really knows where it is, but it's next to Palo Alto. Uh, the wine country in Napa is there. So the Bay Area is a big place. It's 7,000 square miles. It's nine counties. It's 101 cities. You know, LA is one big county with four million people, but it's also a fractured community of, of really small towns without, within, a big, uh, within a big county. So we just kind of cut right to the chase in the Bay Area. We just have a small group of homeowners associations with mayors is, is, what, is what we have. So uh, I'm going to mess with this as I go. So um, if I can't get to what I'm doing, it, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, I want to show you a map eventually. Um, I think uh, the one thing about where you are in, in your history right now is that you're on the right path. Um, the organization that I work for started on this path in the 1970s. It has a great advantage that, that, that you don't have right now, which is a dedicated funding source and a strong sense of independence. It started there. You need, 
you need to get there. Um, that's a, one of the most important steps. Also, what the Bay Area has is what I just said. It, it's the Bay Area. It's a place. It's a place to rally. It's a sense of joint identity. And uh, I think southeastern Detroit really needs to get past the history that I remember. I, mean, I remember when WJR Radio had J.P. McCarthy when he said that this is the greatest radio station in the world and, and you believed it because it was true. It was, you know. And, you know, the honest truth is, is that's not true anymore. Um, but it can be achieved. Um, I think uh, I, I want to describe a little bit uh, about the work that, that we do that hopefully isn't about us but can inform you. I'm also going to be short so you can ask us all questions. And that is public transit is not the dog. It's the tail on the dog. The dog is our society and the economy and the world that we live in. But without a tail, the dog doesn't really behave very well. Okay, so often public advocates in the Bay Area think that public transit is the mean, is the end all, but it's not. It's a means to an end. So uh, you know, Chris came to my little hometown of Alameda, and I didn't know Chris at all. He was a friend of a friend, and we went on a little jaunt, and I guess I ended up on the radio here. Is what happened. Um, but we were able to walk down. We actually we drove, parked, went to a little coffee shop. And we could watch people get on casual carpools uh, to drive to the city. You could get in the car with a stranger. Um, there's really fun etiquette around that, particularly with the women. Um, you could have got on a bus and done Wi-Fi into the city on a bus. You could have gone to a BART station, which is our sense of the Washington, D.C. metro. We ended up taking a ferry boat over to the city. All of that is available to commuters really very quickly. You know, my kids walk to school or ride their bike. Um, I think Chris saw some kids skateboarding to school. And the point of all that um, is that public transit forces us to tame the car. So we all love certain things, like I love having a beer, but you know, seven is too, too many, right? <laughs> and, and the car is like that. The car is like too many drinks in the punch bowl, and the party gets ugly really fast. So we got to figure out a way to live in harmony with this great thing, right? This great thing. But we can't let it get out of control. If it gets out of control, you can't have a community that is livable. It's, you just can't do it. Now, it's hard to describe that to folks, but it's easy to show it to them. So I would urge the folks who are trying to lead this effort is to try to scrape some money together with your civic leaders and visit some of those communities that are like yourself, where you can really see it in operation. It can really, really open your eyes to the possibilities. Because in the Bay Area, people vote for taxes. We have about a billion dollars of revenue that comes in just for public transit, actually more than that, if you get to all the numbers. And people vote for it, not because they use it. They vote for it for someone else will. You know, they want to drive the road without it being congested and hope someone else takes BART, okay? Um, they also know that like term limits, the cure was much worse than the disease, okay? Much worse. And we don't want to build our way out of congestion because if you do, you get Phoenix, you get Houston, uh, you get Dallas. And in all due respect to my relatives who live in Atlanta, Georgia, you get Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, and uh, I'm just going to show you that, or I'm going to make the case that LA is making the right decision. It was a hard thing to do, but they, they came around. And LA is our competitor. The LA Basin's 14 million people, the Bay Area 7. We fight like cats and dogs, but we do agree on one thing, and that is regionalism is what drives our economy. And LA is very similar to LA, or LA is very similar to Detroit in that LA had a huge employment scare. Uh, when the defense industry went down. And it, it was a huge sobering effect on them. And it brought business and labor and advocates together. And Detroit has had that scare. It's just taken Detroit a little while longer to kind of recognize it, I guess. Um, I always felt you got to work hard to bankrupt General Motors. But, um, but you did. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to try. Oh, here we are. Um, what was it about California? Yeah. Got to work hard to bankrupt California, and, and we are. Um, so here it is. This is my boss. So, oh, my God, it's so fast. 
I'm just going to show you one map or, or, or one thing. That's this. I hope, it's, I hope you can see it. Um, I think this is the most important idea that I can try to get across to this group, and that is who you are. And uh, what you are is that you are part of Metro America. And as you can see, Metro America is not that much land. It is not. It's only 12% of the land in the United States. But look at these values. 95% of the public transit, 94% of the venture capital, 92% of the airboardings, uh, air cargo, patents, the economy, jobs, degree holders. That, that is what Southeast Michigan is. You have, you have University of Michigan, you have this university that we are in, you have Wayne State, you have General Motors and Ford still. And what you need to get people to do, in my opinion, and what my board members do, the board I work for, which is not too dissimilar to the board that you now have, they come to the table many times from small towns that only have maybe 20,000 people. I mean, I'm not kidding you when I say it's a homeowners association with a mayor, okay? But they come knowing that this is really who they are. So while we have Stanford and Cal, and we have, um, you know, San Francisco and Oakland, and Silicon Valley, you have that too. And you have to be able to get people to come together because the cities need the suburbs. The suburbs are incomplete without the city. And I guess the best example here in southeastern Michigan that shows it is the professional sports teams. You know, they're here in the city. They are nothing without the suburbs. The suburbs are completely incomplete without those. So I think that's your biggest challenge. And Good luck trying to solve it. Randy, thank you very much. Um, can our presenters please meet us for the uh, panel portion of this discussion? I'm going to take time for a brief conversation and uh, field some questions prior to our breakout sessions. Okay. Thank you, timekeeper. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the biggest questions is, and what we're really interested here in the uh, metropolitan southeast Michigan area is, what are some of the uh, best practices that we should incorporate here from your 30,000-foot view of the uh, process? Um, I think, the, like I said, the number one thing is building out that coalition and making sure that people know that they are invited to the table. Um, and to encourage them to, to come to the table. Um, the other thing that I would say is I've heard a couple of questions about the opt-in, opt-out philosophy. And the opt-out is how we got MARTA only being supported by two counties. It was a five-county vote, and three counties opted out. So once you do that, there's not enough money, really, to sustain it in the long term. So I think we've learned our lesson with the opt-out concept. Uh, one thought would be to work on organizational structure of this group. So uh, at some point you have some legal standing and you decide uh, what kind of IRS designation you want. Um, you have some leadership. You get this many people in the room, um, it's great, but occasionally six or eight people need to sit around and prepare agendas and budgets and things like that. So um, think, about, think about that and, and how you put together um, uh, this group as a, as a legal entity. So I, is this, is, this, is this on? Okay, so I guess my thought to everyone is, is that you've all heard the metaphor about we're in a marathon, not a sprint. Sorry, I'm sorry, that battery is a little weak, so you're gonna have to do it. I think everyone knows the metaphor of a, we're in a marathon, not a sprint. But I think for Southeast Michigan, I would say before you get the privilege of losing an election, um, which you will, I mean you will, you always win the second time. You, you know, you, you don't often win the first time. Um, so before you get the privilege of losing, what I would say to you is that you're not really in a marathon yet. What you are is that out of shape person, probably in middle age. <laughs> who doesn't even have the running shoes, <laughs> and then got shamed by their kids um, and challenged by their kids to do it and took up the challenge. 
And so it's going to be a long way. And I would just urge you to not get frustrated by how far it's going to take. Because, you know, the, the, the example of Los Angeles, I think, is a really good one. Because in the Bay Area, in where I live, this was all put there for us. They really built it down there well. You know, the community organizing, getting it right, getting a, you know, not having problems um, to get the consensus, to get the things together takes a ton of work. And so I would start there. Okay. Now, we saw two different versions of how to fund a uh, transit system. One coming from vehicular and or gas tax. The other coming from a regional sales tax. Now, I don't believe we have the authority to authorize a regional sales tax yet but that could be something that could be done by the state legislature. What have you found in best practices from around the country and in your own experiences about funding the transit system both ways? Well, we had to go to the legislature to get, to get the authority to levy a local tax, and, and that's a story in and of itself. One thing we did um, to get it, originally it was a half cent, now we're authorized up to a full penny, and we didn't introduce a bill, but we had the Transportation Committee Chair of the Senate prepared with an amendment when, that, when a bill was working its way through the final day of the legislature, and he stuck it on. So we didn't have any hearings. We didn't have any opponents. Uh, we just got it, just got it done. So uh, the other thing about the sales tax, it's quite... That is how to do it, yes. Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, Interesting thing about the sales tax, which I have not had a chance to research just yet, is uh, if Congress passes this uh, internet sales tax national thing, that's going to bump up transit funding. I, I'm not sure how much, Jason, I, or if anybody's looked at that or Art. He's, I guess he's not here. So, so, and that's why the road guys want it to. I think that I would agree on the on the sales tax concept. Um, like I said, it took us four years to get our legislation passed um, at the legislature, going through various iterations of do you do it regionally, do you do a statewide sales tax. Um, the one thing that it, if you do do a sales tax, you have to be careful of is exemptions. Who gets in there and gets behind closed doors and asks to be exempted? For example, exempting motor fuel tax on a transportation sales tax. So that, that was one of the things that people threw back at us in terms of being against the referendum. And we, what can you say besides, well, somebody had a, had a backdoor conversation that I didn't have. <laughs> so there's not a lot of ways to justify some of the exemptions. So you just have to be careful about that. Uh, you know, I, I guess uh, just a thought. You know, the U.S. Constitution really matters. Um, and... Uh, uh, like, for example, the U.S. Senate would be clearly unconstitutional, except it's in the Constitution, right? So the fact that I have to share senators with L.A. and I only get two, but Wyoming with 250,000 employed people gets two is completely ridiculous, right? Well, the same is true with regionalism. There is no space for regionalism in our form of governance. The federal government has a relationship with the states. And people tend to have a relationship with their local government. And so how we construct regional bodies to succeed, because this is really the test. Our competitors are in China. How do you do that's the key. And so when you talk about a big county like LA with 4.5 million people or 4.2, it's still a county. So the nine counties of the Bay Area overcome this because we have county-based sales taxes. And they succeed. The relationship with the region is with the state. So my organization, just to give you a sense, is allocates more state transportation funding than many states do. So the way we build regionalism is to have our own fund sources, like we have $600 million worth of toll bridge revenue that's controlled by my organization. But we let the sales taxes stay with the counties, but we do the plan, and they have to meet that plan. And that's the trick we have in order to give people that sense of ownership and locality and not have the outcome that Atlanta did, um, which was that it's too big for folks to understand. Uh, one of the key components was getting the adoption by all the citizens of the district up to 30, a two-thirds vote, a uh, simple majority. 
What were you able to do to incorporate the grassroots and to get them encouraged to come out and vote and support for the, uh, these efforts? Well, our grassroots effort was, uh, like I said in the presentation, was run by Service Employees International Union, who had access to the uh, voter van. It's called, the nickname's the van, the Voter Action Network. So they had a ton of data uh, on voters in our district. They knew who was likely to vote in, on an April election. They knew whether they voted in a Democratic or Republican primary. Um, they knew a ton of other things that uh, they would not tell me that they knew. And so we, we, over, we, we did overlays, you know, like my membership list went in, Sierra Club membership went in, the bike people's membership went in, and then we tried to ID the people whether they were likely to vote yes. If they were a frequent uh, voter who was likely to vote yes, we didn't bother them. If they were an infrequent voter who really liked this, we pestered the hell out of them. And offered them ride to the polls, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards to make sure that they got out. Um, we, we did not have a, we, I don't take any credit. In 2008, there was not a good ground game in place and part of, Part of the reason was the consultants did, know, did not have to know how to work with volunteers. Where There was competition with the Obama, our governor's race, and a Senate race for volunteer time. And there was competition for access to the van, so we did not have a good ground game, and it showed up. Obama was winning some of those districts with 95% of the vote, and we were getting 52. You know, shouldn't have, shouldn't have been that way. Um, one of the thing, one of the criticisms of our referendum was that we didn't do enough grassroots grassroots outreach, um, and you know we did everything similar. We got the voter file, we analyzed the vote, the data, we analyzed the voter profiles. We even had um, some internet tagging that we did. I mean, we we had nine million dollars, so we did it all. Um, but sometimes you get to a point where all of that gets blown up and you can't go by the data anymore. Once you have such a um, us-them environment, which is what eventually got created with the opposition from the NAACP, the Sierra Club, um, and the Tea Party. So at some point, we had to throw all, everything, all of that out the window and just make sure that we knocked on doors and um, made our phone calls and tried to get our folks out as best as we could. And I want to comment on something uh, Denny said and, and about being in a November even year election. I used to believe that. I'm not sure I still do. And for this reason, we, in our market, we weren't able to raise enough money to blast through Obama and who did he run against? Uh, Hillary. Hillary. In the November, we, we couldn't blast through all the presidential, gubernatorial, Senate ads. Kane. Yeah, McLean. So, if you're going to be in a low turnout election, you got to have a low turnout strategy. And uh, I mean, for instance, TV was mostly cable, and we did not run any TV in those areas that were likely no voters. We did not remind them that there was a spe there was an election coming up. So you can do lots of things these days. And we tried not to remind people that were against us that the election was coming up. But sometimes when you're the biggest thing on the ballot, that can backfire too, because that's where pe everyone focuses. So basically, you just, it just depends on your environment, your region, your opposition, and how well you've gotten out there ahead of time. All right, we're going to have to shut this down. I think we have time for, well, actually we don't, but we're going to do it anyway. Take two questions, one and two, and that's going to be it. We need to get to our breakout sessions. Well, it is an important strategic question. It is an important strategic question as to what kind of election you're going to be on, if you're an election at all. Because if you are a low turnout like special election, you really need to do the targeted stuff, which means TV is a bad idea. If you're in a very large turnout general election, then you really want to drive the turnout with the TV. Did you have that kind of discussion or opportunity or option between, within your campaign? 
We, we did have that conversation and that discussion, but I think the, the prevailing sentiment was that we had to do TV, especially cable, so that we could have local targeted messages because we had so many projects on the list. So we had to tell cable area by cable area kind of what was on the list that benefited them. So. One last question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Shay, this is another question for you. Normally, you would expect the Sierra Club and the NAACP to be natural allies. What went wrong? I think that um, we took for granted the transit vote and the support of the transit vote. Because, you know, when you had a project list with $3 billion in transit and you've never had that type of investment since MARTA, we made an assumption that the transit folks would, be, would come out and they would be supportive. Um, and most of them were. Um, the Sierra Club, I think, made a decision that the, um, the road in improvement part was a too far of a cost for them to bear, even though they were getting the $3 billion in, in rail. Um, so their argument was that all that road, road improvement increased sprawl. The Tea Party it liked the road improvement part, hated the transit. So you have that dichotomy, and then the, the NAACP, certain chapters, not all of them, came in and said, well, there's not enough minority participation. George, the, Georgia uh, Department of Transportation typically hasn't given a lot of minority contracts. They have a, very, a dismally low percentage. Um, and we worked very hard to, to work around that and put together with all of the agencies a commitment for minority participation, but it just wasn't enough. All right, I'd like to thank the panelists this afternoon, and we will be going to our breakout sessions.